Hi, welcome everybody. I'm Barry Kostrinsky. This is Artist Talk on Art. This is our 35th Monday virtual open studio. Um, we have grown together and become a great group. We do outreach as a result of talking so much and being together. Um, what we've done the last 35 Mondays is captured on our YouTube channel, um, Artist Talk on Art. You can look us up there. Of course, we have Facebook and Instagram. Just pump, put, push in Artist Talk on Art and you can see anything you like about us. We are a 501c3. We've been around for 46 years, mostly in the Lower West Side of New York City. We hope to go back to 12 West 12th Street when it's safe, and we will. But until then, we will do this. And once we go back, we will do this as well. We will run side by side. Some interesting things we have coming. Um, I put it out in our email blast. If you don't get it, use the chat function and go ahead, type your email in, and I'll make sure you get our email blast. I have more programming coming and varied programming. In the beginning of the year, we're gonna to start to do something where the first of the month is a formal panel. By the way, not so formal, just meaning I will have artists lined up who will present and we will go for the same format we've been doing where it's interactive and everybody talks. For the last of the month, I'm lining up performance art and I'm gonna have um, Veronica Pena curate those events. Um, and we have something very interesting coming for first of the month and last of the month. And usually when artists want to present, as most of you I'm sure do, think and everything but beginning and end of month. It will start a little bumpy because on uh, January 18th, we have a uh, dancer from Scotland who's going to be uh, talking and putting on a unique presentation. So we have some of these organized presentations and then our more casual ones where we all get a chance to share whoever wants to. Once again, we're a 501c3. All this is for free. If you'd like to contribute, there's plenty of information on the website. And thank you to all the artists. I see many artists here who have contributed and it helps our organization greatly. We appreciate it. Um, let's start off uh, Larry Ahrens. Larry, welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, thank you so much, Barry. Appreciate it. Um, the last time I was here, I had a chance to show you some of the contemporary things I was doing. Now I'm going to do a quick reverse back to some of the more classic stuff I do. Um, so give me a second. Um, these are one, I, as a matter of fact, this one I just did this morning. Whoop. And by the way, keep in mind, if you get a phone call, you might want to mute yourself. We are, sure. Zoom is very, no, talking to everyone, Zoom is very sensitive. So far, I don't mute everybody. Everyone seems to do the right thing. So thanks, everybody. So uh, just quickly, I'm just going to go by real quickly. This is an oil selfie I did this morning. About uh, three, three and a half hours worth of work. You did that in one sitting this morning? Yeah. How much coffee did you have, Larry? It was the cocaine. Uh, <laughs> Larry I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I know. I, know. Uh, I do work uh, quickly. I'm very focused. So this is a quick one that I did. This is another selfie, of course. Here I am in a fez. <laughs> um, I do things that are really what I call very different. These are watercolor and pastel portraits. I don't know if anybody can mm -hmm. see them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And how, oh. Go ahead, please ask me. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Then uh, I'll quickly do another one to show you. This one is in glass, so if it gets a bit of a shine, please excuse me. Hmm. Larry, what advantages do you find to working quickly? Um, you know, uh, Barry, uh, it's not an advantage. It's what my process has been my entire life. Um, back in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, I had my own ad agency. And uh, there was always tremendous amounts of deadlines. And in facing deadlines, what I always did was really carve right to the problem 
and say, well, what is it I need to do? And I decide very quickly how to manage that problem and I move right through it. So um, when, I, when I started painting, I used to use the same process in my mind. Okay, I look at it and I say, what do I want to do? And you know, this one is, is a really good example. Um, I just take a, a black canvas and I literally with white chalk draw my outlines and then I paint in the outlines and I don't try and do shading on it. What I try to do is feel the energy of the skin as it turns from light to dark in, in a very strong chiaroscaro um, effect. Uh, so each one of my pieces has that mindset when I approach it. So um, let me I, ask you, how do, how do you achieve that? So you look to see total gradations from light to dark, right. which is sort of the trick to rendering in three dimensions. Um, you need that shift from light to dark. How do you achieve it? Well, um, when I do a painting such as I did this one, um, I don't do a dividing line like some people put the dark and then they do the light. I literally go from one edge to the other constantly working so that I get a chance to see how the rotation of the paint feels within the canvas as opposed to, okay, now I've got my tonal values, I've got my darks and I've got my lights. I don't approach it that way. I approach it as a holistic piece, working color everywhere at the same time. So if I do a red dot here, I look at the piece and I say, well, where else would red feel comfortable? Sometimes red only belongs over here and it doesn't belong over here. So it really takes a, 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 an understanding that you're looking at it holistically as opposed to piece by piece by piece by piece. And that takes a, a period of time to understand. It's so beautiful. It is. I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Robin. No, I was just gonna say that it, the, the, the light is so beautiful. Thank you. It's, it reminds me of a Dutch Massive. master's painting. Yes, like a very Rembrandt influenced or, by them as well. Yeah. You know, I can relate to how you approach it because when I do an oil painting and I've got, let's say, red on my brush, I like red go around the canvas where I feel it makes sense. And yes. it's partly because I don't want to clean the brush and go to the next color. I mean, I want to use it. It's a utilitarian, utilitarian sort of approach, but it does get that sort of, you know, there should be a relationship. If there's red there, it should relate to red somewhere else on the canvas. Exactly. So, even and, later you know, on. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I was, I began painting when you did. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that we were aware of was to get the whole thing, which is what you do, that everything on the painting is done to the same degree. You don't do one corner and then go to another spot and another. You're working the whole painting at one time. So it's all very, maybe it's all very vague or it's all very scattered, but it, it's, it, it comes together at once in a way. And I think you do that when you do what you were just saying. You use the color here, there. You, you're, working the whole, you're working the whole page or the whole canvas at once in that way. Um, and I think I mean, that's very important. May, maybe you said it, but do you have a photo or you look in the mirror? How, how is it? It? It, really, it really does depend on which one I'm doing. In this case, I did have a photo because um, I was working in a very short period of time. And um, so the photo is next to the painting and uh, I worked at it from that aspect. Um, this one, the Fez was live from a mirror. I mean, from, uh, yeah, from a mirror. So I'm looking at it and um, I'm feeling how it should look. Um, and, and you can see there are two different styles in the way I am painting here. This one is a little bit more uh, flat, if you will. This one is a bit more rustic. I'll just use those as two different terms. So, well, you have a great capacity to, to look at you, yourself. Not everybody can, you know, really- I understand you know, project, that. Project a self-portrait like you are doing it, and especially in a few, just a few hours. I mean, it's really incredible. Well, well thank you very much. I, I appreciate the comment. Um, 
maybe it has to do with the fact that, of course, that I did have the pressure of being in the business world, having to meet deadlines all the time, that I'm able to, you know, produce a, a painting or a drawing rather quickly. But usually it's um, anything I do is, um, unless it's a commission and I take time and then I walk away from it and I come back, uh, usually my work is done in uh, under one day. Oh, very impressive. But, you know, when I do my work and I do a color here, a color there, I'm a little abstract and it's landscape. You've got to get the sort of ratios and proportions right. Yes. So how, how are you able to do that when moving to different sides of the canvas? Because often if you work in one area, you can use relative position to know you got this shape in relationship to this shape. You obviously have a strong eye to be able to move to another part of the canvas. Well, um, Barry, it's what I, I said before. Um, I do a, a, a line drawing on the, can, on the, uh, the board. It, this is not just a free form. Let me see how it's going to look. Okay. So uh, the line form gives me a sense of parameter as to where things will go. But um, as we all know, you put a, a line down. The line is just a thought process. It's not carved in stone. So if I'm working on something and I need to expand the shadow, then the line is meaningless. All it did was give me a starting point. So um, even when you do a landscape, well, maybe not, but when I do a plein air landscapes, I do a quick rough as to where I think things might fit on the canvas. And it's at that point I start to fill in the color or the wash or whatever it might be that I say, well, this needs to expand or contract or the tree needs to get bigger or whatever the case is that, that you're painting. Um, and sometimes, you know, you'll put a piece down and all of a sudden it'll change completely because you say, well, it doesn't feel right. And that too can happen with a portrait. But when you're doing a self-portrait, there are really restrictions upon what you're doing. Because if you're attempting to, to portray yourself, then you know that uh, your nose has to be a certain shape. It can't be, you know, if my nose has got to curve downward, I can't make it come to a point. So you kind of like look at things in, in that fashion. And then when uh, I look at something from a color and a shade perspective, it's literally just that. Um, I, I put down a dark, but I might also put down the light next to it and not touch it, but then come back to it by adding a different color. Um, I don't know if you could see, but uh, I've added a very strong red color on the side of the uh, cheek. Mm. And in having done that, uh, the only other place that you're going to see that red, believe it or not, is in the ear. Because it didn't feel right to be anywhere else. So what that did was it takes your eye from here to there. And again, I'll look at another color and I'll say, okay, well, maybe if that red, it's actually orange. If that orange is too strong, maybe the orange belongs in the bridge of my nose, but on a softer feeling, so it's toned down. So there is a sense of one, two, three. So you get a sense that the light rolls with the color. You know, it well, <clears throat> you really know your mustache. <laughs> you really it's a fabulous you know you know yourself you know well, how to i've been looking yourself. at myself a very long time my birthday is saturday happy <laughs> birthday okay. thank you okay happy birthday <laughs> thank you you know when you were holding the painting right up next to your face like you're doing now i was struck with the accuracy of the coloration. Oh, thank you. you. Know, absolutely amazing. Thank beautiful. you. Just beautiful. But thank you very much, uh, Basha. Uh, but I do have a mirror looking for color. You know, because a photograph is never really the real color. That's right. So, uh, so I look at the mirror and I say, well, there is a tendency to be a little bit more red or a little bit more yellow. It, it really depends. Yeah. But uh, thank you. That's a very good observation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Does anybody welcome. else do uh, self-portrait work? Fran does. Who? Fran. Hi. 
Hi. Hi, Hi Larry. Hi, Fran. Yeah, yeah, I've been enjoying this. I'm actually doing, I do a lot of self-portraits, and in fact, this year for the I'm going to put this down. If anybody cares, I'll bring it back up. This year for the fourth time, I'm doing a self-portrait a day, so I can relate to your doing a self-portrait in a day. Mine are drawings, but same idea. Yep, I yeah. think that um, uh, drawings are, are wonderful. Uh, I taught a, a student on Friday who had never done drawing before in her entire life. The only thing she had wow. ever done was a bog drawing of the lips, right? And I told her, I want you to not even think about what you're looking at. I want you to just feel, hold that pencil and just feel what's in front of you. She was astounded by that in her mindset, you know, that she didn't have to put the line down this way. So I said, now as you start to feel it, you start to understand what you're looking at as a shape, as opposed to, I've got to make the nose look like this. And that's one of the things when it comes to even self-portraits is to feel it. I mean, when I do a, a portrait in a class, I can sit there for the first 10 minutes and not pick up a single thing to draw with, just so I could look at that model and get to feel what she is, who she is, so that there is a real sense of connection. I, I've ended up doing paintings where I said, I've got no connection to this person and I hate the painting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else has experienced that. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. I did a series of African-American uh, young men as models. Does anybody have a chance to see or do African-Americans at all? Sometimes. I have, I have. Well, uh, I've been very lucky. I met, you know, three very terrific young people and two of them I immediately fell in love with as models. Would you like to see that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Give and me a moment. Anyway, can I Larry. ask you? Yeah, go ahead, Fran. Oh, I'm just curious how old your student was that you were talking she was, to never she has a daughter in her 30s, so oh, okay. What is that the idea? <laughs> I don't know. 50, 60, 60 something. 60 ish. 50. Yeah, yeah, she was not a, uh, a teenager. I I'll be right back. I do want to say some of the comments in the chat. Uh, Regina Gratis said, a beautiful self portrait, very moving. Uh, Leah Poller expressed uh, truly sensitive eyes. And Regina also said, to me, the red looks like you are bleeding or have an open wound. And it certainly does bring out what's underneath the surface of the flesh. Uh, people have been adding their Instagram into the chat. So this way, if you'd like to follow an artist, feel free to do that or put your website in, anything you like. I want to welcome Norma Greenwood, one of our board members at ATOA, and point out that uh, as well, Fran Beeler is a board member and Roberta. So welcome all. Um, they are what make the ATA sort of do the behind the scenes work. But as I always point out, the two guys that are artists talking on art where we're together. Larry, let me ask you, when you draw or paint, when you do your painting, would you say you work with line or you work with form and shape when you paint? Uh, combination of both, it depends on what I'm looking at. In other words, um, well here, Let's say in the portraits that you've been showing us. So here, this is one that I just did that I was talking about the African American person. I work both with line and with form. And I'm gonna show you an example of that because in two weeks time, I had a chance to work with them a second time. By the way, this is a one day painting. This is what I did the second week. Mm. So this is a combination of watercolor and pastel. So it, you get a chance to see, in a way, two views of the same model with two different mediums. And this one was done with no, with no shape. It started all with line, and I built on it. This one was done with shape and with some line. But what, even what I do with this, how I start every painting, I draw. Not with uh, sepia ink, I draw with pencil on the canvas. Then I spray it with shellac. It dries 
two or three minutes, and then I paint over it. You know, that's a traditional way of doing it and certainly has its advantages. We once had an artist point out that uh, if you draw your painting first, you're finished before you begin. And it was like a brilliant line because you've seen, you've put your original impulse down and you haven't started in a way and you finish. So my point is there are different ways to approach it, but that was really shocking. I, when the artist presented that thought, I had him repeat it again so I could really understand. Larry, I gotta say this, the work is brilliant. To do that in three hours, it takes certain special sight, as somebody pointed out. Have you ever thought of sort of forcing yourself to give, give it three hours and then another three hours and another three? And I mentioned this because I, I, I have a strong memory of a Goya exhibit that I saw at the Neue Gallery. And I saw his portraits. And those portraits were beyond portraits anybody's ever done. Right. Not all of them. It was like one or two in the room were amazing. And sure enough, when the Times reviewed it, they used one of those portraits. So I think you can, you know, you're at a very high level. I think if you go back in, not to these, but if you take the approach that you got to do seven sittings of three hours, something's going to happen. Something that well, happened in Goya's portraits. So um, here, this is, um, this is about eight hours. Okay, so this is roughly two, maybe even longer, three days. And I'm sorry, it's under glass. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this. Can you guys see this? A little tricky, keep it away, I think is better. That's good. Yeah, no. Oh. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. So this is all pastel. Yeah. It almost looks mm -hmm. like a photograph. It's so perfect. Oh, well, thank you. I don't know, is that good or bad? I think it's good. I love Beautiful. it. Beautiful. Yeah. Almost, I don't know, she looks like she's like dreaming. Like yeah. it's. Yeah, she was fabulous. Yeah. She was a terrific uh, model. Oh, it's a she? It looks like a he. Sorry, I got to ask Lawrence Wheatman. Lawrence, is that good or bad if it looks like a photograph? He's ready <laughs> to sink his teeth into a few of us. Lawrence is a, a professor of uh, photography and has great insight into photography. I think one of the great things you once said, Lawrence, is when people ask me what camera I use, I, I think you say, you like, don't want to tell them. It means nothing. And I think you have, you know, you're really deep in your field. What do you say to that when somebody says it looks like a photograph? Well, first of all, you misquoted me, and that's not that it doesn't mean anything. It's just that it's just a tool. It's you know, what kind of brush do you use? If you give a hundred the same brush to a hundred different artists, you're working with brushes, you're still going to get a hundred different pieces. And that's the, the camera too. But anyway, uh, if it looks like I mean, I I'm in, I am um, encouraged when people look at my work and say, "Oh, that looks like a painting." So I <laughs> <laughs> I think you can go both ways. I agree with you. you certainly, uh, you've got the, uh, Larry, you, you've got that person incredibly well. I mean, I, that's what we all hope for is to uh, honestly depict the person that we're portraying. The, uh, uh, the thing, Lawrence, that I, that I really look to do is I look to not always try and do the same thing over and over and over again. Um, if anybody goes to my um, Instagram account and you'll see, I, I didn't realize how many pieces I had posted, but I have a, uh, a large array of pieces that I showed earlier of the combination of watercolor and pastels. And uh, the thing that really I love about doing that is they're never the same. No two can even be close to being the same because I don't approach it that way. Uh, I mean, I, I've labeled the entire grouping is called improvisational portraits for that reason, because I approach it from a, oh my gosh, it's brand new. There's no really process by which I uh, say, okay, well, this is gonna go here and this is gonna go here. Um, the way I do it, and some people say, oh, how do you do it? Do you draw it and then put the watercolor on? And the answer is, uh, let's see if I have this here. You might be able to see it. Um, the answer is no. 
I go in with watercolor painted on a page, an Archie's page, and I allow the watercolor to do whatever it's going to do. Then I sit down and I look, and I may go in with two or three different pages of watercolor, all different colors, because I don't know what the artist, I mean, what the model is going to be. And then I sit down and I work the drawing on the model based upon the watercolor that I see. So it's really a, uh, a, an emotional feeling that I um, have when I look at the art, I mean, when I look at the model, that makes me say, okay, well, this is the right way for this moment to approach it. Very nice, Larry. I just, I think, claps for Larry. Beautiful stop, work. Stop, stop, stop. No, it's all about mutual support. That's what artists do. And that's sort of snaps and claps. You know, it's, we all as artists get enough rejections from galleries and exhibitions. It's nice for us to support each other once in a while. And I think that's what we've grown here. And of course, you know, think of it like your grandparent. Your grandparent, if they did it right, they're like the ultimate support system. And we're all your grandparent, Larry, no matter how old you're gonna be on your birthday on Saturday. So well, I, I will tell everyone how old I'm going to be so that doesn't leave the question mark. I will be 76. Very nice. Thank you so much. I am Thank going to move you. on. Happy birthday. Happy Thank birthday. you. Happy birthday. Happy uh, birthday. Before we go to Wendy List, Helene Solar, you wanted to uh, make an announcement this week, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm uh, forming an exhibit for Women in the Arts Foundation. And uh, the website is www.wiaf.org. And it's going to be a 50th anniversary exhibit. Uh, we're celebrating it at the Ceres Gallery, uh, June 22nd uh, through uh, July 17th. And uh, our members are free to uh, join this, this exhibit. And uh, we're inviting some uh, very special artists who were original founding members and former members that were uh, in our many uh, landmark exhibits in uh, the 70s and 80s. So it's bound to be an exciting exhibit, and I hope uh, some of you will join us. Very nice. Thank you, Helene. Um, Thank you. Someone has asked, Larry's last name is Aaron's. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, A-A-R-O-N-S. A-A-R-O-N-S, Larry. Thanks again. Um, let's move on to Wendy Liss. Wendy, always interested to see what you'll present. Hi. Okay, so as you see, I'm just going to give you a little walk through the studio, and then we'll talk about it, okay? So this time, we're going to start with some pieces that are, um, you know, unglazed. This is what I've been working on. I might have to flip you. It seemed like last time we were happier going vertical. Might have to do it. Oh, let's see. It's working. Totally okay. working. Okay. So my interest lies in this contrast between the ripped edge and, and the smooth surface. So these pieces are just drying. Let me see if I can turn it. It's hard to show 3D because it's really important to see it all around, not just from one point of view, because, you know, it's three-dimensional. Well, no, that's definitely working on the turntable. And okay. Understand when a sculptor approach, when painters approach a work of art, it really is a straight on look. When sculptors work, you've got to move around the piece or have the piece move and you've got to consider what's the impact from this view, from that view. And of course, photographing a sculpture is impossible. Am I right, well, Larry? Challenging, for it's sure. Challenging because there's a, you know, you, you're capturing a flat of a three-dimensional object and you can't reveal. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so there we go. That one's spinning. Are you starting off with slabs that you're then ripping? So, yes, slabs and coils. This area, you know, that's a, that's a big slab that I rip and tear. And then I start to build the rest of the form with coils. 
So I'm showing you this piece because um, this is unfinished. I started to add some color to the interior, but this is a similar piece that is finished where um, it's already been fired and it actually uh, went into a pit fire. So you'll just tell me if you can see or. What, what are the sizes of those? Is that about 12 inches higher? I can tell. Yeah, you know, 16 inches. Mm -hmm. So really what I've been, you know, the last time we met, well, here it can, here's another little pairing. Mm. Nice. I really have been spending these past months experimenting mm. with different surface treatments. This is collage paper. Mm, I like that. Mm. Wow, I love that. Beautiful. Yeah. Still leaving some of the exposed clay. If when you, you say it's paper, is it, is it paper on top of the fired clay? Mm-hmm. Oh, fired nice. clay. The dark brown is, is the clay body. You know, I left some of the clay body showing. Mm -hmm. Let me point out, there is an aesthetic among ceramicists that you want to, even if you glaze a piece, you do sometimes at the bottom, and it's not necessarily all ceramicists, but you want to show the raw clay. It's part of like truth to materials in a way. So oh, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not surprised you're doing that. Mm -hmm. These are beautifully well, varied, Wendy. I mean, from the monochromatic piece here, which of course is not monochromatic because of the shadows, and the other very colorful one you just showed us. Yeah. Well, so, so what? Painted? Yeah, so what I'm playing with here is, well, here, let me come around and show you this one. This, this piece was glazed. It's a very reflective surface. Mm -hmm. It actually came out even more reflective than I thought in the future when I use this glaze. It's very cool, but I think I want to use it more um, in a particular spot, not all over the entire thing. Mm -hmm. So what I've been searching for is the, a, a surface treatment that will enhance the texture and add to the piece, not take away from it. So I, you know, so here's, you know, me playing with glaze to get that, but then this piece to glaze it and to glaze it in an even way or where it's not going to stick to the, the kiln shot. I don't know. I just was spending all this time. How should I glaze it? What should I do? And then I just said, I am sick of trying to figure this out in my head. It was this gorgeous day just the other day and <clears throat> there was all this green outside and I love green, it's my favorite color. I just said, I'm just gonna paint this thing. I'm just gonna paint it, you know? I needed some instant gratification. So, <laughs> so there it is and that was kind of different because then I painted this piece and I started to realize, wow, if the surface is the same, then maybe that makes the texture stick out more. Does that make any sense? Yes, Absolutely. it does, it works. Yes. You know, I was varying the surface to enhance the texture, but maybe if the surface is the same, that shows the difference in texture more. I love um, the color. That was my little discovery on that. Wendy, yeah. uh, a quick question. When mm -hmm. you paint, your pieces and I see they're all singular in color. Do you ever consider adding an additional shade to your pieces in the shadow? Like it, I'm just gonna say your, your piece is painted in green and it's let's say it's a leaf green, would you ever consider painting the shadows in a hunter green? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for example, on that piece, well not that, I, I did it on that piece, but uh, other pieces where there's more a uh, more specific edge so the answer is yes but then I thought you know what that is the point of working with these shadows like see how the inside looks like a different color and the oh, you know, it's like 
you know, I mean, uh, so I started to say, you know, no, don't do artificially what light is going to do naturally. It, you know what I mean, Larry? Like, so I, I just, did. because at first I was doing that. I was varying um, the colors to enhance the shadow, say. But then I just thought, no, let me just see what happens not doing that. Uh, you know, just making it one thing. So anyway. And the pieces um, that are in the shelf um, have a, yes. a piece on top of them. So it adds dimension and depth to your shadows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when you take them out and they're in a, a not a, um, a shelf where there's a covering over it, you lose some of that deep detail. And that's why mm -hmm. when I saw it, that's what posed my question. That was all. But absolutely, it's definitely put to this way. If I continue to paint the pieces, I'll definitely play with that. When you're glazing them, you just don't really have that kind of control. That's why else it actually felt so good to just mix a paint color and paint it and actually see what the color is when I'm doing it. So this, I just want to say this to Olga, because Olga, last time you asked me a question about this piece and I completely didn't hear you because I was delirious. Um, you asked about if I ever considered making it bigger, you know, that, um, and, and the thing, is, I mean, that would be nice, but of course, no, it's not reality. But what I do try to do is when I'm making the pieces, I try to visualize them as being bigger, you know, small pieces that feel big, you, you know, like, um, you definitely achieve that. They, they have a sense of larger scale than they are. Like here, look, I put a little deer in there. <laughs> because that piece was inspired by like slot canyons. So, you know, just to shift the perspective, I just, you know. Yeah, you know, Wendy, uh, these pieces are really amazing. It looks like a big jump from when I saw your work initially, which was some time ago. And uh, these are really amazing. Yeah, really beautiful. I, I love Thanks. that. So, Wendy, do you do you design or do a drawing like in, on a pad or just how how is your process? Like you have the the shape in your mind and go for it, or do you mm -hmm. do like a draft? I mean, how is the process of creating this? Shape? Yeah, what I do, what I do. Though I wish I. Well, I have this, um, do you see that pad there? Mm -hmm. um, you, yes. you wet it, did you ever see this? It, you wet it with a brush and then you can paint on it. Um, okay. I'll, I'll have to pull it on here. Anyway, it, I do gesture drawings just to warm me up. You know, here's some of the kinds of drawings that I do on paper, just to warm up. It's just to get movement, really. Um, but then when I'm, when I'm working on the piece like this, uh, I'll refer to, you know, like you can see, you can see the shapes in here in the drawings, you know, so, but really I'm not, I mean, you know, down here I was, you know, designing, uh, some, you know, a, a vase, but it's, it's, it's really, um, life is always better with clay. Um, Wendy, would you say, yeah. uh, well, um, would I be right and to say you're a fan oh. of uh, Henry Moore? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, oh, wait, okay, so wait, maybe because we're getting finished, so now I'm going to flip back. We'll look at this piece. So this, you know, I'll end on this and then we'll talk. Um, because last time we were together, I did talk about these stones and how I was coloring the clay body so that I didn't have to glaze, but that I was gonna experiment with um, pit firing on top of the colored clay body. So here's some examples of that. And then this piece is the colored clay that I'm about to pit fire, even though it really feels like stone and there's something really kind of nice about it, like the texture but I'm doing this for someone and they want it pit fired. So I'm gonna to try to do it. I mean, really, I was pretty happy 
I really match these students pretty good. I want to say, uh, Carrie said, uh, beautiful ceramics. The genius, Regina said, gorgeous different textures. Um, Helene Solar, love the low crater. Um, somebody did ask, what is your clay base? And uh, uh, I guess, are you firing, uh, pit firing is a low temperature fire. Am I correct with that? Um, okay, I have to say, there's not just one clay body. I'm, I'm using just so many clay bodies. I look forward to um, simplifying my life, but at the moment, so um, I use Raku clay when I am doing the pit fired pieces. I use um, like a 420 sculpture clay, if you know clays, that, that I'm adding the um, mason stain pigment to um, when I wanna color the clay body. And, um, you know, so it just, you know, it just depends. Actually, I've been playing with um, some paper clay because I found that um, I can get really good textural tears. You know, like the Raku clay is good for the pit firing, but it, I don't get good tears if I want the texture. So, you know, I've just been, but you guys told me last time, there's no right way. There's no wrong way. Don't look for a formula. Just keep experimenting. So right. I just want to tell you, I heard you and I've been experimenting and I've been um, just, you know, still, if I'm struggling with anything, it's the surface treatment. It's really um, because I love the initial building and constructing of the pieces, but then it's like, Oh, you know, I don't want to ruin it with the surface treatment at the end. And, you know, it's not like Larry where it's done in a couple hours. And, you know, this is like I put a lot of energy and effort into one stage. And then it takes a lot of time for it to dry because they're thick. And, and then, you know, they'll make it through the bisque fire. And then you do the next thing and then it doesn't make it through the next fire. You know, and it's just like to be free about it is very, um, <coughs> you know, tricky. Yeah, like this. I don't know if we really looked at this big bowl there, but I made this really big vessel bowl. And I loved it. Just loved it. And um, it made it through the bisque fire. And I, I got this really cool glaze. But, you know, it didn't totally make it through. But I learned a lot. And I'll still use it for something. But Wendy, do you <laughs> work on more than one uh, piece at a time? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. The other question that I had is I really like some of the bases that, you know, that, that with the long uh, metal. Where do you get those? I okay. So, because um, that even happened since we last visited. You know, I really <laughs> wanted to... Um, to list that I want it because I, I really want them to be gestural and feel like dancing and movement. So I just thought, you know, they, because it's clay, they were feeling very kind of bottom heavy. So a friend of mine who is a um, metal artist, I just asked him like, would you make me some bases? You know, like if it wasn't during COVID, you know, like we did a zoom thing. I did some drawings. I showed them, um, but I have to say, um, well, so I have some pieces in a, in, a, in a gallery exhibit right now in Baltimore and some pieces in, in Philadelphia. And when they came to select what they wanted for the shows, um, the bases are really heavy, some of them. And so they didn't even want to use here. I like made this big deal to get the bases, like, oh, these are gonna be the pieces that are gonna get in the show. And then they're just like, we don't even want these pieces because the bases are too heavy. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need it's to read them. It's a base. big decision for somebody working mm -hmm. in clay or sculpture. Where do you set the object? Painting goes on the wall. Maybe you're concerned with what color the wall is. Maybe not. Um, usually white, a quiet color. But sculpture, if you looked at Wendy's form, there's form at the bottom that you want to see. And if you set that on something, well, all of a sudden the rectangle you set it on starts to interact with the form. So it's an interesting solution that you raise it up on a stick. 
If you look at Broncuzzi, he sort of realized the importance of the base, and the base is often integrated into the work. This is a problem right. all uh, sculptors come to. As well, the question of glazing. When you put a glaze on, you can put the same glaze on two pieces that are the same and put them in the kiln, and they'll look different. So it really is, you have to be open to that. And if you want to get a set color, yes, uh, today you can go ahead and paint it. Sometimes in the past that was considered sacrilegious. The contemporary clay sculptor is fine to do anything they want at all to their right. piece to color it. Um, so you make the choices and you make the decisions that work for what you want. I would say, Wendy, when uh, Larry made the point about maybe do you use a darker color inside the shaded area, I naturally would think, why don't you trick it and go for a lighter color where it should be darker to create a push-pull in the space. You know, just I know, but what happens is if it's in that interior space, it gets its own natural shadow and then it ends up looking the same as the color on the outside rather than contrasting it even more. You know not, what I mean? Not easy, okay. but certainly shadows is one of the joys of sculpture and especially yours. It adds, you know, it brings light in, but it also adds coloration. And it's certainly a big part of your work, which uh, I'll read some of the other comments. Jill Gerwitz, Wendy, amazing. Um, uh, there, let's see. Uh, Olga Alexander, Wendy, this is wonderful. Uh, let's see. Oh, thank you. Beautiful, Thanks, beautiful you guys. Beautiful work, Wendy, from Basha Ruth Nelson. Uh, really, a, a lot of compliments for what people are seeing. Regina Silvers, I love the juxtaposition, juxtaposition of the miniature piece and the large one. It really changes scale. And also, I want to point out, when you showed the rocks that you used for the coloration, I sort of like the rocks on the sculpture. I think that's mm -hmm. a way to sort of bring in, you know, expand sculpture and have it be more, uh, uh, expand ceramics and have it be more sculptural, sort of a mixed media work. Um, but what do you guys, what do you think about the bases? Like, because the, the things, like I'm really looking for feedback on is the surface and the base it, like, does it add to it to have that relationship? I mean, I really am thinking about doing, um, you know, it's like. Could, could you build bases with, could you use like natural bases like out of stones or wood or? Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah, bases. like these are some things I've been collecting um, for a base. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And, uh, and I have some, um, Mm. Yeah, some did, did actual, you, did, like some <clears throat> actual stones that actually, you know, I, I can even I can drill into the stone, you know, and have a rod if I want it elevated, you know. You this know, one uh, <clears throat> if you use a metal, you may try also iron, black iron, uh, because you have those like those greens and those terracottas. So the contrast maybe with black iron may be more, more rustic than the other. Yeah, yeah, I, I like a another, rustic. Another I possibility. Well, well, I'll show you this one base that I love, but it is so heavy that it's a little ridiculous how heavy it is. <laughs> but, um, but I can put a big sculpture on it, speaking of rustic. Good idea. Oh, oh, is that solid? Oh, nice. it is. It's saw. Uh, it weighs a ton. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, was it made, that was made by your friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it possible he could make them out of lighter metal or hollow or something? <laughs> yeah, it has yeah. to be. Has you know, if be. it wasn't these COVID times, um, this could get handled a lot easier. But right now, yeah. it's just. It's just hard, yeah. but uh, but I'm just happy that um, that I got some things that I could uh, play with lifting the work up. I just wanted to really play with, um, you know, lifting Wendy, it. Up I, lifting. I worked with a ceramic artist, Bruce Sherman. We did exactly what you said. He would you would take rocks, 
we would, I would drill them, which by the way, it's really hard to do into a rock. It's got to be a certain rock <laughs> you can drill into. And I went through plenty of drill bits, even the really strong ones. And then we put a little pole in. And of course, you got to drill really straight. Um, and then we would, you know, have it stick into the sculpture. Um, and it's a beautiful presentation. Mm -hmm. um, the rock sort of is a few inches away from the piece. It looks very sharp. It's a nice way to do it. Um, there are a lot of solutions, but uh, I, I think you've got the idea. We even used wood, like you're using, drilled into it, just a little, uh, you know, quarter inch steel dowel, and then put the piece on top so it's floating. What comes to mind for me is some of the great galleries that were ahead of their time, they actually hung paintings from the ceiling. So the paintings were floating in the space and they put a painting behind the painting. And it makes me think you could use a uh, fish wire and you could actually hang the sculpture. Of course, very dangerous. People could walk into it, but all of a sudden it could be floating and you could really see it as a three-dimensional object. Um, Wendy, um, I'm gonna ask you to listen to two artists' names I'm gonna tell you. Mm -hmm. um, the first one, who is one of the most unbelievable sculptures, sculptors I have ever seen. She's with uh, Herschel, Herschel and Adler. Her name is Elizabeth Turk, T-U-R-K. Mm -hmm. Her work is beyond description. Um, also very modern. She takes things with marble and makes them feel as if they're running water. Astounding. So please look at her work. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the second woman, her name is Tanya, T-A-N-Y-A, Wolf. Ragar, R-A-G-I-R, and you can see her work on Instagram, and it's at Tanya A. Ragar. But you must, and I, I, I share this with everybody, you will be blown away with Elizabeth Turk's work. You will, your, your jaw will drop open. That's how spectacular she is. You know, uh, she's a woman, um, I, I don't know, our contemporary, maybe a little younger. Uh, her studio is out in California. Um, she is a, a, a grant winner. What is the big, the big grant, Barry? What is the big grant? Oh, Paula Krasner? Is uh, no, one? MacArthur. MacArthur, oh, that's the big one. Yeah, she won the MacArthur grant. Uh, also known as the Genius Award. The Genius Award, yeah. Uh, Wendy, I'm telling you, she will inspire you in ways that you will not even imagine once you see her work. Truly. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for that recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank out, you, everybody. Uh, Thanks for the feedback, everybody. I appreciate great it. Great work, Wendy. I enjoyed looking at it. Thank Norma, you. Gre Norma Greenwood said, Wendy, beautiful forms. Um, and asked, are you inspired by dance? Yes. I dance, I actually dance <laughs> when I'm starting the pieces. You know, I, I really, I'll dance before I start a new piece. I'll roll out all my slabs, I'll get everything ready to go. And then um, I want to bring that dance energy into it. So I'm hoping they'll get even more dance energy. Good read, Norma, good read. Yeah, a lot of good energy. <laughs> good. Um, I'm just going to say claps and snaps. Wendy, beautiful presentation. We've seen Thank your work you. before, but I think that was, uh, that was very nice. And uh, certainly everybody contributing with their thoughts uh, is really I rounded it out. Um, Bear, I, I just want to make one comment about Wendy. I remember the first day she spoke, she was so uncomfortable. The difference is like night and day. I love it. And I love your, her work. It's absolutely magnificent. Thank Thanks, you, Roberta. Roberta. It's nice. Um, I do feel more comfortable with the group and with my own self. So thank you for noticing. <laughs> thank you for so sharing. I'm going to give you a, a great line that I've always used. And the line is, if you're not on the edge, you're taking up too much space.
<laughs> nice. That's a good one. That's a good one. I will say to other artists that I see here, if you want to present one night, reach out to me beforehand. Tonight we had a few artists do just that, so the program is sort of uh, filled. But I do see some new faces. Very happy to see it. You're all always welcome to show and present your work. It's just that I do have to give precedence to those artists that have already uh, sort of signed up for the night. But so nice to see so many faces tonight. We are gonna move on to uh, Basha Ruth Nelson. And uh, I'm thinking um, to help with the presentation, Fran, you still with us? Um, I am. Um, what, or what's, maybe uh... Mike. <laughs> Basha, would you like to try and do it yourself? No. <laughs> yeah. um, well, so, we, so where should we send Fran to to get your image? Here? Well, <clears throat> I can help just telling basharuthnelson.com. Okay, I, 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 I would love to do this. I'm sorry we didn't do it earlier. I was about to send a text saying that I have to leave early. So uh, I wonder Michael, if Mike could help out. Mike, could you help out? Michael is the, the genius of the website. Not really, but I can That's really. <laughs> Basha, should I go to your website? Go to my yes. website. Okay, it's just your name? Basha Ruth Nelson, yeah. While you're doing that, I want to point out Michael Krasowitz, who's helping us out, does a talk on Thursday. Uh, I think it's 7 p.m. You can go to his Facebook for the information, and it's uh, via Zoom. I went there last week, it was a great dialogue and sort of in link with one of the conversations that was being mentioned. Uh, Jill Gerwitz, a photographer who showed her work here is also a mu musician. And we had an interesting conversation about artists' ability to do one or the other or both. And Jill certainly answers that question. Um, you can do both. So it was nice to, uh, you know, nice to hear Jill's music uh, that she sent to me and to sort of, you know, see, uh, see artists working in both venues at time. So, Basha, tell us, where are you from okay. now? Uh, I'd like you to see a, sh ver a short video. It's less than three minutes video about just... my Freedom Project. And then I could tell you about it afterwards. So if you go to Walls of Freedom Project and to the video, Walls of Freedom Project video, yeah, and it should play. Nice job. In Basha Ruth Nelson's interactive Walls of Freedom exhibition, on view at the Hudson Valley Center for Contemporary Art now through July 31st, the gallery goers were invited to both tear down and write on the walls. We put up walls within ourselves that stop us from being real. Put up walls between nations. And I want people to get in touch with that. And the action, the action tearing these walls in, I think it helps us to realize we can tear walls down. No, not everyone felt compelled to rip the place to shreds. It's wonderful, all right? We gave like I didn't have a chance to pull down stuff. I didn't feel I needed to pass. Like there, the energy of it, that it took to do all this is actually, in a way, more exciting for me than, than actually doing it. Todd Brannon, who installed the project, offered this insight. This paper is, is a green wrap, like a packing wrap, successfully stretched out. I think it's uh, extremely creative and fantastic. Uh, the concept of uh, tearing down walls and building bridges is something that we uh, While certainly tactile and sensory rich, Walls of Freedom is also provocative, challenging the participants to express themselves with the written word. If this came out of Ruth's head, 
it's inconceivable that any of us have any understanding of what else is in there. And it's a lot. And, uh, and if we hope to discover it all. <laughs> Expressed sentiments ran the gamut from funny to serious. It's so contemporary. It's today, it's tomorrow, it's forever. And a good time was had by all. The strength of Basha Ruth Nelson's participatory art installation, Walls of Freedom, is that it leads you thinking, reflecting, and feeling. So tear down to the Hudson Valley Center for Contemporary Art between now and July 31st and catch Walls of Freedom. That's it. Asha Ruth Nelson's Interactive Walls of Freedom exhibition on view at the Hudson Valley Center for Contemporary Art now through July 31st. Gallery goers were invited to both Can tear turn it off? and write on the I don't know where that's coming from. Put up walls within ourselves. I don't know either. You have to close the website. You have to close the whole website and go back? Yes. Okay. Actually, it's not coming from me. Maybe not. It's not coming from me. Though not everyone felt compelled. Can I stop screen sharing? Are we going to just discuss? You know what? I'll stop screen share sharing, then I'll go back into it. Maybe that's what it was. Hold down. Like I said, it's not coming from me. I'm going to mute a few people just in case. To do all this is actually, in a way, more exciting for me. Bear with me, I'm going to uh, sort of mute. Todd Brannan, who installed the project, offered this insight. This paper is, is a green wrap, like a vacuum wrap, so it has to be stretched out. It's easier said than done, but I can do this. There extremely creative and fantastic. Uh, the concept of uh, tearing down walls and building bridges is something that. There we go, I think it was Elaine. But either way, um, okay. <laughs> okay. took care of that. Um, I, I think there will be maybe be not. No, go go ahead. I I was saying that uh, she has images that uh, you know in the same uh, you know file that they are like photos that we can see the whole project. And I do want if to point out if anybody here the Hudson Valley uh, yeah Center for Contemporary Art is quite the space to see in Peekskill. Um, yeah. It was founded by a doctor. It's become a nonprofit. It really is a, uh, a contemporary center in the middle of what's like the woods. There is a little art scene in Peekskill that is worth seeing, but it, it is a treat to go up there as I was once lucky to do so. And it is, uh, you know, to be able to exhibit there is, uh, quite a pat on the back for you, uh, Basha. It's, it is, I consider it a museum. Thank you, thank you. I, I don't know how to get this off the screen, but- Where, where do you want to go next? Basha? It will be maybe to put some of your images, Ruth? Do yeah. we have Walls them? Of Freedom? Yeah, I've got, your, I've got your website on now. I'm sharing your screen, that, my screen. So what do you want? you want to show sculptures or installations? No, I'd like to talk about the Freedom Project. And then I can, at another time, maybe talk about the sculpture and other work. Or okay. if there's time. Okay. Yeah, thank so go you. Go ahead. Go ahead. You talk to us about the work. And, yeah. Uh, uh, the Freedom Project started actually in 2013. I was exhibiting in Procida, Italy, uh, which is a, an island off the coast of Naples uh, in the chain with uh, uh, Capri and Ischia. And I met a gentleman, Bernd Brussig, from Germany, from Berlin. And they were preparing for the 25th anniversary of the coming down of the Berlin Wall. And, I be, and he struck a, a conversation with me based on an installation I had done there. And I became absolutely uh, captivated with the thought 
of walls coming down. And I started to study the Berlin Wall and I learned things that I never knew. Uh, the absolute horror of what really went on that I was never taught in school. And so, I don't know, the thought of doing installations about walls that people could tear down and write their thoughts about freedom. And I started to collect all the I images uh, of people tearing down the walls. I've done it so far in, I think, about six locations. And uh, capturing, I have books and murals and uh, photographs when people actually write on the walls uh, of what people have said. Uh, it, it, they range from the most heartbreaking to the most hilarious. Uh, one of the most heartbreaking ones was in an exhibition in Reading, Pennsylvania. And, uh, and it was, Freedom is having medication when you're sick. If you don't have medication, freedom is death. Signed by a 17 year old without medication. Now I read that and my heart stopped, but underneath that, someone else wrote, I will pray for you with a smiley face. And I always felt that I hope that that 17 year old saw that and maybe got a hug. But, it, but the comments, they range. And the joy that I get in putting up the installations. And then I had all these comments, I thought, well, maybe I should put them in a book but I'm not a writer, I'm a visual artist. So I partnered with a friend of mine who's a musician and a songwriter, and now we do performances where I narrate uh, some of the stories I've heard and some of the things that people have written, and that's interspersed with him playing and singing. Uh, some well-known songs and some that he's written. And um, I just keep going with it. So it's that project. And politically now, I wish I could be out there doing it, but I can't. But I think it's, uh, it's really where we are about tearing down the walls that separate us. And then my other work, I work in metal mainly, and I do sculpt large sculptures that you saw on the screen. That one is at Riverfront Green Park in Peekskill, in Peekskill. And I do very small, tiny, you know, little sculptures as well and, and installations. Basha, I, I, I can't help but be hit by the contrast metal very hard to cut and obviously impossible to rip by hand and yet at hudson valley contemporary art center you did a work where you could rip paper was there some some balance there that you were seeking or some attempt to do the opposite of metal uh no i don't think so barry uh because with the metal except when I'm doing a very large steel sculpture that I have to do the maquette for. But most of my installations are by hand. I, I use aluminum flashing that's used for roofing and I cut it. I have, <laughs> I have amazing scissors from my grandfather's coat factory that was handed down to my mother and my mother handed it down to me. And that cuts the metal so beautifully. And then I just form it with my hands. And whether I'm doing a huge wall installation or a small one, uh, 
it's it's very tactile so well uh, i don't know if you have any image of your installations in metal now that you are mixing with the installations on paper <laughs> uh, i i don't know how to access them uh, of course i do yeah no. we have to go back to your website <laughs> We have to go back to the website. We could always save save it for another time. I was going to say we it. could save that. Let me point out to the time. artist, yeah. Basha, when you do a project and you engage people for a response, you don't know what's going to come. And what often surprises you is the depth and variety. I, when I had a gallery, I once took a piece of wood, and when people would come in for the show, I also asked them what what do you fear and so everybody wrote on the piece of wood what they feared and of oh, course you had everything from cockroaches to death but then i flipped it and i said to the pe people how do you resolve that fear wow and you end up with this collage like you probably got that pulls at different poles and yet sometimes someone's thought relates to someone's thought by chance and you get a beautiful mosaic of ideas. And I, I just can't say how when you start with sounds like a simple project, the simpler it sounds, the more complex it gets when people interact with it in a very good way. And so the artist maybe opens it up. You open up Pandora's jar. It's not a uh, box, by the way. Pandora's jar, there was a mistranslation. Uh, from the original language. And that lets a lot of great things come through. It really does. And you've obviously done that and you saw how it evolved what you were doing beyond what you probably thought. And that's mm -hmm. very touching, <clears throat> very touching what that person wrote. And obviously he probably didn't get the hug, but you gave him a hug by letting him get it out. It was like a cathartic release for him just to write it. So that was the hug, so he could express it. Otherwise, maybe he keeps it inside, and maybe it does something very bad for him. What I, what I enjoy when I, you know, we are close, Basha and myself, so what I enjoy is that uh, she can do the installation without attachment. It's not, a, it's not to have the final project, because the project becomes a different project, like a bunch of, pieces of paper on the floor. It's just the action and the detachment that she has. When she does these installations, they are big. It was a huge room at the, at the museum. They had some Valley Mocha is now, uh, that's the name. It's not anymore Hudson Valley Center for Contemporary Art. They changed it last year for Hudson Valley Mocha. So, uh, it's, it was a huge room. It was a big enterprise of papers and layers. And suddenly at the end, it was almost a year, that installation, and you replenish several times. Yeah. And it's the detachment of the end of that exhibit is no longer what you saw at the very beginning. And that is really an interesting position, not only for people to express, but as an artist, the final product or installation is no longer there. It's really like, you know, a very situation to have that detachment. I wanted to say it in public. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And, and Barry, thank you also for what you said. I never thought of that and it, it's a comfort to me. It really is because that writing has stayed with me this whole time. So thank you for that, really. You're welcome. And uh, thanks to Alyssa, your big sister. It was yes. really sweet the way you sort of helped her out. And of course, to Michael for helping with the technical things, which you did great as always. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, keep in mind, we're here every Monday. Um, I send out emails and we do have some special things coming. I hope you all We'll enjoy them as well. I'm always up if anybody here wants to make a special panel presentation, bring together some artists around a theme. We're totally up for that. Just 
You'll see my email on our website, atoanyc.org. Again, we're a 501c3. This is all for free. You are what make artists talk on art when we're together. If you'd like to make a contribution, take a look at our website. There's many and easy ways to do it. Um, I want to thank you all. What a variation from Larry's presentation with paintings that, you know, really, you know, hit a, a very high level, but are very focused and Larry's hand. And at the end, to Basha Ruth's work, where it's other hands ripping the work and the work evolves. And then, of course, the work is in the action of the other people. So it's really not containable. So again, art is, is as Wendy said, um, you, you, you're, it's open to you to set up your rules. There are no right rules. Um, we as artists tend to keep experimenting and that's how we grow. And uh, we all do it in different ways. The only thing is you put your heart into it, you commit to it, maybe you dance before you do it, you somehow get going, and that's how we're living at our sort of highest level. And uh, round of applause to all the artists and all the participants. This was our 35th gathering. Uh, anybody who's new, become a part, become regular, tell your friends about it, you know, tell your congressman. Yeah. And you might be a congressman. I want you to know, I cycle. Whenever I pass a, a cyclist, they always nod and say hi. Cyclists are not nice people. I, I, I have saltwater fish. People who do saltwater fish, you naturally bond with people. I think artists do the same. And if we could get our politicians all to go to life drawing, they would change. They would become different people. And uh, I, I have to commend Roberta, our board member. You know, she's the one who always says, I'm not an artist. She's taking classes online to do watercolor. And I told her, we're going to have her speak once. She's not here now. She had to leave. But we're going to have her speak as a novice. And one thing you should know, whenever a novice talks about art, they're dead on about the questions because they're entering those original questions that we've sort of forgot sometimes and we've gotten very deep in a path. But you watch. Roberta's going to say some things that are going to awaken some thoughts. And I'm going to make her speak. So thanks so much. This was great. You're a great group. So nice to see. And we're all becoming friends. And like I like to say, we're a beehive and we're a tribe. So thanks from the Artist Talk on Art. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's a great night. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Barry. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy.